So last time, we got our workbench installed. Now, let's start customizing this and adding some software to it. So the first thing that I'm going to start with is the extras. So for those that remember or know, Amigo S 1.2, 1.3, I think 1.1 and, and earlier, they came bundled on a workbench disk and an extras disk. Extras is kind of like it sounds, it's the stuff that wouldn't fit on the workbench disk. So uh, let's take a look in extras now and see what we want to pull out of here. And there's a few different things on here. Um, First off, I want the whole tools directory. This comes with some useful utilities uh, and little gadgets, uh, notably an icon editor, a font editor, micro emacs, uh, and these perfmon tools, which I, I kind of like sometimes to watch and see. Um, so we'll copy this entire folder onto our workbench disk. Now you can tell how basic this interface is, right? There's no progress bar, there's nothing. We dragged tools from extras to workbench. It's doing its copying, but we don't know when it'll be done. It's done when it's done. <laughs> and uh, it's very primitive. It, it, even compared to you know, later versions of, of workbench, this is extremely primitive. Um, all right, so we have our tools copied over. Let's, uh, the next one here is PC Util. Uh, so these I'm not going to copy, but I'll, I'll talk about what these are. So there is a five and a quarter inch floppy drive for the Amiga called the uh, A1020, and there were clones made too. When that was released, these PC copy utilities were included in extras to allow you to transfer files from IBM PC formatted five and a quarter inch floppy disks. Now these are user interfaces. They don't do this in an Amiga native way like a program like CrossDOS does later. Um, but this was um, you know an early uh, early attempt at kind of some of that interoperability. And we have our first crash. <laughs> I don't have the five. I have a. I have one of these A1020s right now, but I don't have one hooked up to the system, so apparently it doesn't like that. So we're gonna have to reboot. I'm gonna eject my extras disk and reboot. While that's rebooting, um, you know, I I will say that those PC copy utilities I've never had great success with, and when you have something like CrossDOS, which actually presents MS-DOS formatted disks in an Amiga native way they're kind of obsolete so so we're not gonna copy those uh, if I can get some DOS formatted uh, five and a quarter inch disk we might look at them in uh, in a later episode on the A1020 but for right now we're gonna leave it alright then the next thing on here, which I think takes up the majority of the space, is uh, Amiga Basic and a bunch of basic demos for it. We're not going to deal with Amiga Basic right now, so I'm going to leave those be. Um, now there's this mysterious directory called FD1.3, and this mystified me as a child. This is actually uh, a bunch of function descriptor files for use in Amiga Basic. So it basically allows Amiga Basic to call Amiga OS libraries um, in your in your Amiga Basic programs, and you, if you were to go to the directory here, it just says important Basic FD files here, but this icon does nothing. The only way you can really see see them is to go into the shell and do a directory listing here and you see all these FD files and if we we look at one of these like say icon uh, lib which 
is the functions for um, icon.library. We can see that it has some information in here about how to call and what the parameter types are and things like this. And th this allows Amiga Basic to call these functions. Um, so we don't want those either because we're not doing any Amiga Basic stuff at the moment. Um, so that leaves fonts and devs in here. Um, let's first go to devs. And just key maps and printers. So extra key maps and printer drivers. I don't have a printer, so we, we don't need any of that. And I don't have a unusual keyboard being in the US and this being a US version of uh, Amiga OS. I don't really have to worry about a special key map. Uh, so we can ignore those. And then fonts is the last thing. And we see there's some fonts here that weren't on the main workbench disk. Courier, Helvetica, Times. Uh, these are bitmap fonts, so those are the original format of fonts that came uh, in the Amiga OS 1.x. 1, 1 um, they're different from later font formats, but they're very straightforward to install. To install these, all we have to do and is copy all the files in this directory to the fonts logical volume. And I need to do copy all so that it will recurse and copy everything in the directories. And so these bitmap fonts have two parts. One is a one is a file called like Helvetica.font. And then there's a directory that has a, a file with a number that represents the different uh, font sizes for these. So once we get them installed if we open up a program like Notepad, we can type, uh, you know, the quick um, fox jumped over the lazy dog, and we can change our fonts here. So we could change this to say Courier 11, but we can see. The, the base system fonts are all named after uh, gemstones, although I don't think Opal's a, a gemstone. Um, but we now have Courier, Helvetica, and Times at our disposal. Alright. That's it for the, uh, the extras disc. Not really a lot on there. But uh, the fonts were worthwhile, and also having those additional tools is worthwhile. If we were really interested in Amiga Basic, which we may may do some episodes on that at some point in time, you know that's a big thing here. There are there are quite a few basic demos that come with this. Um, but we're gonna skip over this for right now. So I've also loaded a fair number of utilities onto this XFER partition. If you recall, the XFER, the XFER partition is a MS-DOS formatted partition that uh, you can mount on a PC or a Mac or a Linux machine. So I've started downloading some stuff onto here uh, that we're demoing later episodes, but I want to get started using some of this stuff. So one of the first things that I need is I need LHA. LHA is pretty much the standard archival tool on Amiga. Although we're fine for very old things, that that's not the case. LHA didn't really become standard until maybe the late 80s, 90s or so. But before that, you see archives of a variety of different formats like Zoo or ARC or ARJ. Um, but most of the stuff today is distributed as LHAs, and so it's a it's a requirement. Now, the the most recent version of Amiga LHA does not run on Amiga OS one, 
So we have to use an earlier version. Now, this means that we can't have a fully licensed copy. LHA was originally a shareware program, and with the latest version, which I believe is LHA 2.15, 2 the original author basically made it freeware in the late 90s or early 2000s after it you know, was no longer commercially viable. However, the original author did not make a corresponding version of LHA of uh, version 1.38, which is the version, the latest version that runs on Amiga OS 1.x. He did not make a version of that available for free. So we're still using the evaluation copy, which is fine. There are some things I think that are not functional, but for just extracting archives, it's perfectly okay. So I have two files here for that. One is this LHA underscore E138.run, and the other is LHA 138PCH.LHA. So this is a patch onto that version of LHA that fixes some date issues. There were both Y2K issues and then also apparently issues uh, starting around 2010. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take both of these files and copy them to my RAM disk. Now this RAM disk may be an unfamiliar concept if you're not so used to the Amiga, um, but essentially the unused RAM is presented as a uh, an extra volume, basically scratch space for you to use as part of Workbench. And, um, you know, you have to compete with programs so you know you don't want to use too much space in the RAM disk but it's a very useful uh, space to do like scratch uh, scratch work so for me I have always when I have execute when I have archives like this extract them to the RAM disk because usually I don't want every single file in the archive so for example um, if we were to extract this LHA uh, E38 E138.run. We see that it has the LHA command, but then also has all this documentation and um, other stuff that, that I don't want. I don't need it. I just need the LHA command. So I extract stuff in the RAM disk, get the things out of it that I need, and then when I reboot, it all goes away because it's the, the RAM disk gets reset um, every boot. Uh, and I've used this as a method to kind of keep things clean for long, long time. <laughs> I'm sure I'm not the only Amiga user that does this. All right, so we've done our self extraction. I now can use this program to uh, extract the the patch. So it's LHA and then E and then the name of the archive. And this uh, this patch is nice because it includes the patch itself and the utility to, to apply the patch to the binary. So we'll look at README to see the exact syntax. And we can see this is the command and it will create a, a, a new file called LHA.new in my current directory. So not exactly the command I'm going to run because I haven't copied LHA to C yet. But let's uh, let's go ahead and do this. S patch. And now I should see a LHA dot new. And we can run this LHA.new just to make sure that it still looks okay. And it, you know, we run it, looks okay. Um, great. So let's copy LHA.new to our uh, to our C volume, which is our C volume is not a drive letter, it's a, it's a volume called C for commands, and that's where our LHA command lives. Although, 
I made a mistake here. I copied the file without renaming it. So I'm going to want to rename C LHA dot new to C L H A. And you know now if I now when I reboot, you know the whatever's in the RAM disk is going to be gone. But I have I have the LHA executable in my in my C uh, folder and rather my C drawer and, uh, and we'll be able to extract the archives. So one last thing before we wrap up this episode. People are actually creating new fonts uh, for the Amiga in the bitmap format as of very recently. It's, it's really pretty amazing. Uh, so I found this on AmyNet shortly as I was populating this uh, expert disk. And it's a font called Luet. So let's copy this Luet font to RAM, extract it, and install it. Just for fun. So I'm gonna in my RAM disk make a make a directory um, to temporarily extract the uh, the the archive to, and then we'll copy it to fonts like we did the uh, the other fonts, and we should be able to see it in Notepad. And Notepad actually has an ability to uh, reread the fonts, so we should be able to see it without actually restarting the program. Let me get my right window here. And we can see, like the like the fonts we had before, there's a luet.font and then a directory with font sizes in it. This only comes in one size, 8, and there are two versions of it. Um, so all we need to do is copy everything from this directory to fonts. And that copy happened very fast because it's from RAM to disk, not from floppy disk to uh, SD card. So let's read our fonts here and see we now have two new fonts available to us. So I can look at uh, Luet, that's what Luet 8 looks like. And this is what Luet without an E looks like. I think the difference is one is proportional and one is monospaced. Looks like without the E is proportional. Uh, but pretty amazing really that people are still creating new fonts for the Amiga in, in this day and age. I'll link to the GitHub repository of this individual that's uh, that's created these uh, in the video description. If if you if you like the look of these fonts and want to use them yourself.